You know, when I was in college, I had completing, completed my training for certification as a medic. And working for the regional emergency services, my dispatcher introduced me to a new piece of technology that changed my life. An electronic Mattel football game. <laughs> now, he and I would play this for hours, which is easy to do when your ships ran from two to four days straight. Now, during this time, I was also very involved with my church college choir, and we were leaving for a choir tour going across the U.S. So I brought this device along. Since our tour also required long hours of traveling on a bus, I ended up sitting with one of the other members of the group on occasion, so I started to teach them how to play. Now, you need to understand that I had become so good at this game that if the other player made even one mistake, I won the game. So in fairness, I taught them all the tricks. And over time, they became pretty good uh, competition for me. Oh, and I forgot to mention that that other choir member had a boyfriend that couldn't join us on that tour. And how was I to know that he was going to buy this very game and when she got back, offer to show her how to play when we returned. Needless to say, uh, he didn't win, and he never brought out that game with her again. Oh, and as to my first point about this piece of technology changing my life, uh, I ended up marrying that girl. <laughs> now, with that in mind, if there's one thing that's true about modern man, it's that he loves technology. For every problem that comes along, there's a new machine, a new app, a new medicine to fix it. But how is he done with spiritual problems? You know, the kind software and chemicals can't reach. Have psychological counseling and man-centered techniques delivered on their promises to help people's spiritual needs? Thankfully, there is one resource that can and does deliver comfort, wisdom, and practical help every time. God's Word. Now, as in all times and seasons, the Word of God is under attack. But I think we've entered a season where those attacks will escalate with even greater hatred toward those who consider the Scriptures to be the Word of God and to be sufficient for our lives. You may have heard the term sufficiency of Scripture. For those of us who may not use words like sufficiency, Mark Twain once said, don't use a $5 word when a 50-cent word will do. Well, sufficiency might be considered one of those $5 words. So let me say it this way. Scripture is enough. God's teaching in the Bible is enough to guide us in this life. Now, you may have heard the Reformation principle of sola scriptura. It has to do with the sufficiency of Scripture as our supreme authority in all spiritual matters. Sola Scriptura simply means that all truth necessary for our salvation and spiritual life is taught either explicitly or implicitly in Scripture. In other words, the lessons are obvious or at least implied in Scripture. Now, Sola Scriptura is not a claim that all truth of every kind is found in Scripture. Scripture has little or nothing to say about the rules of Chinese grammar or possibly rocket science. But the Apostle Peter tells us, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to light shining in a dark place. Now therefore, Scripture is the highest and supreme authority on any matter of which it speaks. Knowing Scripture was important enough for God to make it a priority for the people of Israel and for us today. When, we, when, excuse me, when he told Moses to instruct parents with these words, these are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me, meaning Moses, to teach you to observe, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, there are three things we must believe about God's Word. First, that God's Word is true and what it says is true. In Psalm 119, we find many instructions about the things we must believe about God's Word. The psalmist tells us we can trust in the Word. Then I have an answer, anyone who taunts me, for I trust in your Word. We can also know that it's altogether true. Your righteousness is everlasting, and your law is true. Now, we can't trust everything we read on the Internet. I know that's a shock. We can't trust everything we hear from our professors. We certainly can't trust all the facts given to us by our politicians. We can't even trust the fact checkers who check the facts. <laughs> Statistics can be manipulated. Photographs can be faked. Magazine covers can be airbrushed. Our teachers, our friends, our science, our studies, even our own eyes can deceive us. But the Word of God is entirely true and always true. We can know God's Word is firmly fixed in the heavens. It doesn't change. Verse 89 says, Your Word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. We can know there is no limit to its perfection. It contains nothing corrupt. Verse 96, To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. Also, we can see that all of God's righteous rules endure forever. They never get old and never wear out. Verse 160, all your words are true and your righteous laws are eternal. Now, if you ever think to yourself, but I need to know what is true. What is true about me, true about people, true about the world, true about the future, true about the past, true about the good life, and true about God. Then come to God's word. It teaches only what is true. In John 17, 17, when praying for the disciples, Jesus said, Sanctify them in truth, because your word is truth. Second point, God's word demands what is right. The psalmist gladly acknowledges God's right to issue commands and humbly accepts all these commands are right. Psalm 119.75 says, I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous. Again, in 86, it says, He says all God's commands are trustworthy. All your commands are trustworthy. We should also know that all his precepts are right. Psalm 127.128 reminds us, Because I love your commands more than gold, more than pure gold, and because I consider all your precepts right, I hate every wrong path. Now, I sometimes hear Christians admit that they don't like what the Bible says. But since it's the Bible, they have to obey it. On one level, this is an admirable, admirable example of submitting oneself to God's Word. And yet, we should go one step further and learn to see the goodness and righteousness in all that God commands. We should love what God loves and delight in whatever he says. God does not lay down arbitrary rules. He does not give orders so that we might be restricted and miserable. He never requires what is impure, unloving, or unwise. His demands are always noble, always just, and always righteous. Number three, God's word provides what is good. Again, according to Psalm 119, the Word of God brings blessing in our lives. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart. You know, when I was preparing my sermon, I wanted a better understanding of the word blessed. So I went to a highly reliable source. 
I said, Alexa, what is the definition of blessed? Here were the results. Consecrated, sacred, holy, sanctified. Divinely or supremely favored, fortunate. Or the last one, blissfully happy or contented. Interesting enough, I also checked the Hebrew definition in Strong's Concordance. And the word blessed here does mean happy. There are two words translated as blessed. One is the verb barak, meaning to be blessed. The other is the noun esher, meaning happy. And this is the word used in this passage. Now, other ways that God's word provides what is good is to avoid shame. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. It provides a way of safety. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. It provides good counsel. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. It provides us strength. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. God's word provides hope. Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. It provides wisdom. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. And should any teacher, excuse me, any teenager in the room read that and say, yep, that's me. I have more insight than all my teachers. I have more understanding than my elders. Remember, it's talking about God's word here. So make sure if you're going to be smart, be smart in God's word. God's word shows us the way we should go. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. But you know, God's word, his revelation, is unfailingly perfect. As the people of God, we believe the word of God can be trusted in every way to speak what is true, command what is right, and provide us with what is good. After the death of Moses, his successor, Joshua, was tasked with leading the people of Israel across the Jordan into the Promised Land. Well, Joshua had heard God's instructions about teaching the next generation from Moses, so we read about one of his first orders in Joshua chapter 4. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at that place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign for you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had, they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Sounds good, right? What a great opportunity for a father and son outing, a mother and daughter outing. Head on down to the river and use this monument of stones to talk about the things that God has done in your life. But sadly, Judges, the very next book, is a tragic sequel to Joshua. In the book of Joshua, the people were obedient to God in conquering the land. But in Judges, they were disobedient, 
idolatrous, and often defeated. The account describes Israel starting to drift away from the Lord even before Joshua's death, with a full departure into apostasy afterwards. I think there are five basic reasons that are evident for these cycles of Israel's moral and spiritual decline. Disobedience and failing to drive out the Canaanites out of the land. Idolatry. Intermarriage with the wicked Canaanites. Not heeding the judges appointed over them. And turning away from God after the death of the judges. Judges 2, verses 10 through 12 says, And after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, meaning the generation that had crossed the Jordan with Joshua, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord, excuse me, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. They had removed prayer and Bible from schools. Their spiritual leaders fell into blatant sin again and again, and the scriptures were no longer used as the instruction for life. Oh, I'm sorry, I deviated there. Um, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger. Spurgeon said, If you turn aside from God's words by a hair's breadth, you know not where it will end. The rail, as in train, diverges but a little where the switches are turned, but before long the branch line is miles away from the main track. So Israel went aside farther and farther from God because they regarded not their way and did not in all things obey the Lord. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, made some comments that speak to this habit of forgetting God. He said, Over half a century ago, when I was still a child, I recall hearing a number of people offering the following explanation for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all of this has happened. Well, since then, I've spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of our revolution. In the process, I've read hundreds of books, collected hundreds of personal testimonies, and have already contributed eight volumes of my own toward the effort of clearing away the rubble left by the upheaval. But if I were, to, were, if I were asked today to formulate a concise, as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this happened. Again, men have forgotten God. That's why all of this happened. Is the Bible sufficient? One final passage sums it all up. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 is in fact the greatest single New Testament testimony to the sufficiency of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3 15 says that from infancy, Paul says to Timothy, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through, the, through faith in Christ Jesus. So are the Scriptures sufficient to save? Paul tells Timothy that they're sufficient. Nothing more is needed. You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Listen to that. The Scripture provides doctrine, all the teaching we need, rebuke, and correction. Rebuke meaning stop doing that. Correction meaning start doing this. And training in righteousness. Taking it a step further, it can turn people around to the right path. But how sufficient is it? That the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What a comprehensive statement. Is it sufficient? Yes, the Bible is sufficient to make you wise unto salvation. It's sufficient to make a man of God thoroughly furnished unto all good works, lacking nothing. The Word of God is absolutely sufficient. Some years back, Maud Fraser Jackson wrote this poem. 
What if I say the Bible is God's holy word, complete, inspired without a flaw, but let its pages stay unread from day to day and fail to learn there from God's law? What if I go not there to seek the truth of which I glibly speak for guidance in this earthly way? Does it matter what I say? Those are pretty potent words. And the answer is no, it doesn't matter. You can say and believe all you want, but if you do not study it, if you do not go there to seek the truth of which you glibly speak, then it really doesn't matter what you say. The word is to be believed and to be obeyed, and therein is the sufficiency. In closing, I want to share a short video from a movie, The Hiding Place. The quality of the video, I'm sorry, is not all that great, but the scene captures a passion for the Word of God that I rarely see around me today. Sister, she needs a doctor. Move on. Papa! Papa! Uh. God be with you, Papa! And with you, my daughters! I saved it for him. Listen, I have family here. My sister, my brother, my father, my nephew, the Ten Boom family. Can you find out where they are? Maybe. Listen, I can get soap, aspirin, cigarettes. You can pay me when you start getting mail. Soap, 25 guilders, aspirin, 50, cigarettes, 100. Most anything. Can you get me a Bible? Everybody's been released, except <laughs> your sister, Betsy, and, and your father, too, I think. I'm not sure. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Thank you. There's a print from the warden's bakery. Fresh. Oh, Lord. You have done wonders. Don't I get a little credit? Lord bless this angel. Bless you. What do you think? You can last here doing that, praying. The only way to live here is to hate. Hate can put you in a worse prison than this. I have been three years in this hole. I worked my way to a position, and I live to get the swine who betrayed me. Now that's 75 guilders. <sighs> Let's be diligent not to let another generation grow up knowing, knowing neither the Lord nor what he has done for Israel or what he has done for you. Let's close in prayer. Father, first off, I thank you and I praise you for the word that you've given us. The Spirit speaks to our hearts, but Lord, it's we receive instruction through the, this printed Bible that you've provided for us. Lord, I, I watch a movie like that, and I'm so moved how 
beyond food and substance. Corey wanted the Word of God more than anything. And I appreciate that testimony, Father. I pray that that same passion for your Word will live in us. But Lord, I pray that we don't wait till we're locked away in a prison to have that passion. I pray, Father, that it's growing in us today. Lord, we commit this morning to you. We commit this day and this week. Lord, as I said at the beginning, I don't know where we are in in history. I don't know what is taking place around this world necessarily that is fulfilling a specific thing of scripture, of prophecy, or making an impact in history. But Father, I pray and thank you for walking with me through it. And I look forward to glorifying you this day and for all eternity. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 